We don't matter, they don't mind. They don't mind. We don't matter, they don't mind. Out of sight, out of mind. Being black in America means doing anything. Even the most mundane things would be perceived through the prism of institutional racism. Stereotypes about who we are as black people distort how we are perceived, often with irreversible consequences. We move through everyday life while black. From the age of nine, I knew I was a runner. It didn't matter what the world had to say about people who looked like me. I silenced the noise and kept going. Running was my source of freedom. Being black in America is a bittersweet journey, but this reality doesn't deter us from moving with purpose. With every story of defeat and overwhelming feeling of despair, we find hope. Blackness is triumph. Anyone who runs would tell you, there is so much more to what we do than exercise. Running is where meditation, science, and time travel become one. But ultimately, three things make a runner. Heart, breath, and time. This series is a celebration of black runners. We are here and a part of Ahmaud Arbery's legacy. Who am I? Used to know. Who lived? When my sons were teenagers, I sat them down and told them what we as black moms call the talk to tell them that they're black, they're males, and they are looked at very differently out in society. So you will have to govern yourselves accordingly. So whenever you're pulled over, you do what the officer tells you to do. Not the second time, the first time. It's just like the one in. Ahmad was always interested in sport, football, baseball. He was the baby of the family. Very, um, very witty, very happy child. We were something like best friends growing up. There were times where I was self-conscious about being dark-skinned, and my brother would give me these side compliments, like, you look really pretty. So he had a very soft side for his sister. <laughs> Ahmad ran every day. He felt like if he was running, he was free. He was free from any cares of the world. Unfortunately, his thoughts was all wrong. What are they doing there now? We're continuing to follow the story of a shooting death of an unarmed black man in Georgia. Civil rights activists say a grand jury in Georgia should immediately weigh criminal charges in the shooting death of Ahmad Arbery. After he was killed, I was told that he had committed a burglary, but it just didn't sound like a mod. Something about it just wasn't right. So I started asking questions, and the more questions I asked, the more lies I was told. 911, what's the address of emergency? It's a black male running down the street. To tell where, where, where at. Stop right there, is it? Stop. I've never seen the video, but a lot of people have confirmed that he fought for his life, literally. I think the last couple of seconds proved that he was brave. He decided in that moment to take a stand. Too many times as black people, we get tired of walking away, and there comes a time where we all 
Just stand up and stand for what we believe in. Run with Maude, one of the big hashtags being used to spread the word about his case. After the video was shared, the outpour of love that we received was just tremendous. There were people that didn't look like Ahmad that was screaming justice for Ahmad. It has been both positive and negative in our lives. I had to be a supportive role for my mom a lot more than I've ever imagined in my life. I patch her up a lot when she's been beaten up by the world, but my mom makes me proud. I feel like if I just would have went on the story that I was told that a mom had committed a burglary, those three guys that were convicted, they would be still free men today. Wanda's passion is all about what can we do to affect change, to create a brighter future for young people. And she found the, the strength to establish this foundation. One of the things that I really love about Miss Wanda is that this is about a mother's love for her son, but on a different level, it's just about this notion that we should all have the ability to live, to dream, and to realize our full potential. And that's what I really hope the Ahmaud Arbery Foundation will do for black boys. A big focus now is to award scholarships to young black men at Ahmaud's high school. These students will have his name associated with their education. I thought most people would give up on me after what I've been through, but they're stuck around, they're stuck around. Really showed me that no matter what you could do, people always still gonna have love for you. They always gonna be up for you. When I'm running, it's like I'm free. I can do anything I want. I'm just really cruising all the way through into my own little world. I like helping people. My future plans is to attend college and major in nursing and get my nursing degree. When some people first see me, they judge me by how I look. When they think I'm a trouble student or I'm going to misbehave in the classroom, but I'm actually not a bad student. I want to be treated like a human being. We're looking for the students that are trying, the students that are really looking to go to college to make a change. We want every child that looks like a mod to have a chance to go to college. I really hope that no other young man ever leave his home for a run and never return. Amon created change and gave us hope. He gave everyone a different outlook on life to cherish the moments that we have. My brother used to say, when life gets tough, get tough with it. It was something simply put that meant a lot to me. and. I actually recite that a lot in my mind. So throw away our chains, put away our guns. Every morning, when my feet hit the floor, I say, good morning, Ahmad. I know that he's with me with every step that I take, and I'm very careful with every step that I take because I know he's watching. But I think that he would, he would smile. Would you rather have me? Black culture is rich and community is vital to our very existence. In Miami, culture preservation informs the past and the present. The founder of Running Edge 305 believes our origins are critical to navigating systems that challenges where we live and work. Right now I'm in front of the Little Haiti Caribbean Marketplace, original design, replica of a market in Haiti. And really just trying to get this area, you know, here for us. This is where I went every Sunday for Sunday school. Anybody from Little Haiti knows this church, Notre Dame Daiti. Magic City is this uh, billion dollar development that's coming. And so they've bought a whole bunch of factories on this side, basically, that's like marking their territory on the city. So that magic sign is, is uh, the magic city development. 
And it's just part of that, that push to move into Little Haiti. My name is Ashley Toussaint, but if you're from the neighborhood, people might call me Ra Ra, uh, Coach T, um, Coach Toussaint, the mayor, the governor. Um, so I go by a lot of different names. I'm definitely a little Haiti kid. My dad was basically the original mayor, right? So everybody knew my dad. His work was predominantly in immigration. Because my dad was such a, was basically the original mayor, right? So everybody knew my dad. His work was predominantly in immigration. You know, a lot of people came to the United States from Haiti, and he was really instrumental in making sure that they had the documentation in order. You saw me get from where you go, And eventually, when he passed, you know, I was left with this legacy that helped almost 4,000 families come to this country. And so today, we're still doing the services that my dad did. All right. Let me uh, just get a prestige, a cold prestige. S'il vous plaît. Right now, you're seeing the impact of gentrification, you know? Businesses are closing. Thank you. I'll get me one before I leave. And now, this generation of Haitian Americans, like, we're the ones that are maintaining what's left. I want to talk about the kind of style you like, the style that really fit us. All the underserved and minority communities were under siege, and I really want to create this narrative that we have the power within ourselves to mitigate gentrification and to own the success and to own the opportunities that are coming to our city. We just got to tap into our creativity, tap into our collective, and not let it just happen to us, but let us be part of the city as it moves forward. Here in South Florida, I've seen that this adult black networking opportunity through running is something that can really take off. That's what running at Edge 305 is all about. Get a good stretch, get a good stretch. It's this synergy, it's this positive vibe, and it's this network through running that we're creating. I don't want to call it a church, but it's kind of created this weekly ritual that people look forward to. All right, y'all, we're going to circle it up. Uh, we're blessed with two new faces today. So if you are a new face, I want you to step up into the circle. Hey! Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. We're going to do the route that we always do. But we're going to run to each of the section, and then we're going to cross to the night and go eat. All right? When my dad was younger, he would just drive all over the city. And I remember these certain landmarks. And when you see a landmark, there's a culture around those landmarks. There's a, there's a story behind those landmarks. So that's how I map my runs. And every landmark is a stop along that route. These are like the childhood landmarks that I remember growing up. Well, these are the days of all lives. A big reason why I run in the communities that I run in is because those are the communities I just feel safer in. I think it's just an extension of what it is to be a black man in America and what our safe spaces are. A black man is not necessarily safe in the suburbs. Well, we got the same pavements, the same sidewalks, the same blue skies. And so we're going to run in Little Haiti and inspire our people. All right, everybody. So this right here is a mural of my dad, Ellison Toussaint. He would help people get their citizenship. Whatever it took to get them here, my father was a person that did that. You know, part of what we do here with Running Edge 305 is we do highlight communities, we highlight the work through running. So it's really important that we keep the essence of the culture, the essence of the community um, by doing this work. So I love Little Haiti. Thank y'all for coming out. Running is collectivism. Not being an individual, but being a collective and being black at the same time. And there's this metaphor I say, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And so the running edge, you know, we try to run as a collective because as long as we do things together in the run culture, we're going to go super, super far. The sky's the limit. And I see the conversations happening. I see people falling back, helping each other. No one's getting left behind. You see the sweat. You hear the breaths. You hear the feet patting on the ground. And you hear the occasional horn honking. You know, people celebrating what we're doing.
take us from the vibrant streets of Little Haiti to the rocky terrain of Arizona, where one runner uses activism to clear hurdles for future college athletes on and off the track. Look around, money day. But if you look closer, it be like money no day. Fighting for what? Fighting for God. Fighting over resources. Fighting for gangs. We fight over lands. What is the plan? Universities must not discriminate on the basis of race, color, national origin. By cutting track and field, you're taking away admissions opportunities and it has a discriminatory impact. If you have the messaging and if you have the right agitation strategy, you can be successful. We need to save track in the US. All right, y'all. Thank you for the time. Take care. I had no intention of getting into this work, but I always say, like, do not mess with the things that are important, the things that I care about. Because when you do that, we have a problem. I had been at a time one of the top 800 meter runners in the US. But when Brown University announced that they were cutting their track and field team, and then University of Minnesota cut their program, I was like, oh no, this might start to be a trend. I mean, here's the thing. The NCAA is about 67% white, and I knew track and field was a sport that offered great opportunity along racial and social economic lines and that it was materially different than other sports in college. And so it wasn't, we gotta try to save this team. It was, nah, we need to save this team. <laughs> so activism found me um, in a way. No one's program is safe. If you think your program is safe, you are wrong. If this goes down, it's going to set off a tidal wave. I got active, I wrote an article, it went viral. If you're a university administrator and you cut track or cross country and you get an email from Russell Dinkins, you should just be very worried. I knew exactly what the impact was going to be. Colleges and making this decision would be eliminating opportunities that would specifically disadvantage black male athletes. And that was something I really could not stand. I, as a person from a single parent household background in Philly, I use track and field as a vehicle to go to Princeton. And I know that my story is not unique. There are a lot of people who benefited tremendously through the sport in order to access opportunity. My source through all this, and I've said this, you know, when I first started it and it's still here now, my source is fighting for that kid whose name I will never know. Activist and athlete Russell Dinkins has filed a federal civil complaint against Clemson University, alleging the cutting of the men's track and field team is in violation of Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Clemson was a whole different animal. I had so many people, even people from schools that had helped, tell me, oh, you're not going to win this one. We're here today to say no more. But by cutting the track and field program, Clemson was making a decision that had an explicit racialized impact and I felt that I needed to create a video because Clemson is literally built on a plantation. It was really clear to me that they were treating their black athletes as commodities exploitable for profit. The video got launched and it had a huge impact. Clemson University is cutting a sport that has a large black student population. That's a problem and it has a discriminatory impact. Cutting this program will result in eliminating 3% of the black male population at a school that already has a problem with its admissions process. We need to save Clemson. This is a problem. We need involved. to be involved in this fight. Every piece of the fight came together to secure us a victory. Clemson track and field has been reinstated. The thing that was really, really beautiful about what we did at Clemson, I know that the impact that we had at Clemson reverberated nationwide. I say my people. Since Clemson, no other major university has announced they're cutting their track and field programs.
Now the journey's different. Now I am still working with colleges, but now I'm also working with athletes. I love to see you know, people like go after their dreams, go after their goals. That high level competition, that's what I live for. Now, after winning the NCAA championships, it gets to the point where you're like, you can't get enough. So I'm gonna be rooting for you, man. <laughs> Thank you. you. Know? I thought my running journey may have been over, but fighting to save these programs inspired me to get back and fight to save my athletic career. Last year, I almost made the Olympic trials and we're on that journey again now. So I run, I bike, and the work continues. I wake up every day to go outside and play. I hear the children say, you African boy. Personal, communal, powerful. Running while black is not running from anything. It's pushing forward for everything. To learn more about the work of the Ahmaud Arbery Foundation and how to help, visit AhmaudArbreyFoundation.org. Yeah.